Okay, yeah. Welcome, everyone. Uh, Danny is not here today, so I'll be facilitating the call. And let me pull up the agenda. Uh, but I know the first thing was the uh, the DevNet. So it seems like it went pretty well. Uh, there might be some minor bugs with block production and the sync aggregation, but otherwise uh, we successfully forked the DevNet, it looks like. And uh, yeah, building a chain. Uh, was there anything in particular anyone wanted to add to that right now? We might, we probably might want to have a chat offline about whether we want to fully declare that success or not. Um, it did, it did pretty well, but I'm not, I'm not sure it, it wasn't, um, like an A plus, I would say. So yeah, maybe we'll have a chat offline about whether we do another one. Fair. Yeah. I mean, I think we definitely want to do another one, uh, but it's still exciting to see progress even from the last one. Yeah, totally. Well done everyone. We did deploy some kind of last minute fixes, and I guess this didn't go that well. I've seen a lot of issues so still on our side. Cool. Okay. Um, we will circle back to Altair after the client updates. Uh, so I'm sure we'll have another touch point for that. So then, uh, yeah, would anyone like to kick us off? Uh, let's see. I think usually we have a randomized list. So uh, let's start with Lighthouse. Hello, everyone. Um, so we've been working uh, a lot on our 1.5.0 release. We published a blog post last week, which details the features it will contain. Um, our Altair progress is coming along well. Uh, 1.5.0 will have Altair testnet support out of the box. Um, we're also working on testing some new upgrades to our networking stack. Um, there's been one last rare bug we've been hunting, but luckily we managed to get a backtrace on it in the in the last couple of hours. So we'll be climbing through the function calls, um, tracing that one down. So that's a good sign. Um, you can expect to see a 1.5.0 release candidate in the next week or two. Um, and after we get 1.5.0 out, we'll start working on the next release. Um, and that should contain weak subjectivity sync, uh, remote signer, and some nice CPU savings looking at perhaps an order of 40% reduction uh, on Prater of CPU usage. So that's it for us. I'm excited for the weak subjectivity sync. I was syncing the chain from scratch the other day and it took a while. <laughs> yeah, so I know it, it hurts. I think us developers um, on it are going to be the ones benefiting from it so much because we can just spin up nodes quickly. Mm -hmm. Right. Great. Yeah, looking forward. Uh, let's see. Let's go to Nimbus next. Hi. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, perfect. Um, so in the past two weeks, well, we had a couple of people at EPC. Uh, besides that, on the dev front, we did a lot of uh, updates to, uh, to have the, a proper working uh, validator client and uh, all the um, uh, REST API. And uh, of course, uh, Altai work uh, so that uh, current uh, testnet uh, uh, goes well. And uh, I would like also to mention that we are starting to work on Wix Subjectivity Sync as well. Great, very exciting. Next, let's do Prism. Hey guys, Terence here. So we released version 1.4.2 last week and uh, it has the awesome uh, doppelganger fe uh, feature. So encourage people to try it out. And it also most importantly contains uh, updates for the London Hall Fork. So don't forget to update it before next week. And then other than that, most of our resources are on a tier optimizations. We have been doing lots of work on um, internally refactored RPC endpoints under one place. And then aside from a tear, we're uh, mostly just bug fixes um, with the E2 API and then, and then the slasher and yeah. And yeah, that's it. Thank you. Great. And Terrence, are the ETH2 API updates, are those in the release yet? 
yeah, those are yeah, those are in the release, and then we encourage people to try out. And a lot of people have been trying out, and then and then uh, opening issues. So that's awesome. Great, yeah, exciting to see. Okay, how about Lodestar? Hey, everyone. So I'm a bit excited to share that finally we have two validators running on mainnet. And they are doing just fine. Almost 95, 96% of total possible rewards we're getting. So super excited to join the club. We, on the side, we have our light client prototype functional and hope to deploy to a proper domain soon. Uh, Kaiman demoed last night at Toronto EDM and it went super well. Uh, on that line, we'll continue to doing research on other styles because this one is REST based. So excited to try other strategies. Besides that, we added support for the ETH1 fallback functionality, and we are working hard on lowering memory consumption. Thank you, Proto, for the help on that regard. That's it. Thank you. Yeah, very exciting. So you guys have a Valdair client now. So we uh, have another one to add, and that's great for client diversity. So it's very good to see uh, the progress on that, definitely. And next we'll do Taku. Yeah, hi. Um, so we put out our 21.7.0 release uh, this week. Um, it's got mostly just a few bug fixes, a couple of things we've mentioned before that are now actually in the release. Uh, the main one is a, a file handle leak, um, which I've been led P2P, bit of a corner case there that slowly leaked file handles, so that's cleaned up. Uh, coming up, so still in the, in in the development branch um, is a whole bunch of changes to discovery as well. We've done a lot of work there to be more standards compliant and uh, have more nodes in the, in the node table and kind of do it all, all nicely. Uh, that's looking pretty good. Um, and starting to investigate improvements around uh, how we store historical state so that we can query that faster. Plus a whole bunch of, of little cleanups and getting ready um, Alto wise, probably the only thing is that we now support the contribution and proof event on the on the events endpoint, uh, so you can track that gossip as it comes in as well. I think that's us. Great. Let's see. And then, yeah, Solius, did you have anything you wanted to add? Uh, Grand Dyna, right? Yeah, so Solis from the Dina team. So we worked on various small fixes and optimizations, and uh, probably the biggest one was uh, improvement of uh, of attestation packing algorithm. So and the, another major thing is that we we proceeding with this experiment that I talked uh, last time. Uh, we will try to uh, to run multiple uh, forks at, at the same time, uh, and it's. Uh, it's taking uh, a bit longer than we expected, but uh, hopefully we'll have some results in uh, in a couple of, you know, of weeks of, of a running uh, client. Uh, but otherwise, I think uh, we will um, we'll need another two weeks. But basically, um, I would say it's a, it's a major thing. And if, if somebody will try to experiment with something like this, then it's probably much easier. Uh, to to take just uh, an existing client uh, that does a forking in a regular, a hard forking in a regular way, and just run this client in in, uh, in two modes, uh, basically. So so we'd have uh, two separate clients uh, uh, instead of one client running uh, running the two hard forks. So so far that's uh, that's probably all uh, from us. Great, thank you. And let's see, was there anyone else? Uh, I think I got everyone. <laughs> we keep adding more clients. OK. Uh, then in that case, uh, we can move to talking about Altair. So there was a DevNet this morning. And uh, it seems like things went pretty well, but there's still some places for improvement, it sounds like. Um, in the meantime, on the spec side, we've had uh, one release, 
kind of two releases uh, in the last couple weeks. So things to improve both testing and then also improving the aggregation count with sync aggregators and then also tightening the gossip validations in this most previous release, uh, beta two. That one, uh, I think was supposed to be in the devnet this morning, but maybe it didn't quite make it out. Um, but either way, these will, uh, these should help harden the sync committee duties on the network and, uh, yeah, lead to, lead to better, better chain. Um, there's, and yeah, like I said, lots of testing, uh, with both of the, both of the spec releases. So please clients, uh, look, take a look at that if you haven't already. Um, so yeah, next we can move to planning. Uh, and like Paul kind of said earlier, perhaps, uh, you know, we move to more asynchronous thing here, but yeah, does anyone have any, any thoughts there? Um, I think we wanted to see how DevNet 2 went and, uh, it sounds like we went at DevNet 3, so that might push back, uh, Altair itself, but, uh, you know, that's something we all need to decide. I'm I'm open to an Altair three next week if um if Perry's up for it. Yeah, that sounds good to me as well. But does this mean we decide today when we want to do a Vermont Altair fork and then s decide to abort it if next week goes badly, or do we just take a call in two weeks? We could probably talk more asynchronously. Uh, I don't really expect DevNet 3 to go poorly, uh, but I guess we'll have to see how it goes. Yeah, I mean, we're consistently seeing the transition work well. The piece we're not seeing is the you know, perfect inclusion rates on, on sync committee signatures. Um, I I think I'd be tempted to, to push it out to, to Piermont at this point and get that feedback, given that we want to kill Piemont after this anyway. So if we really decide we've got to make massive changes, it's not the end of the world. But it just gives us a, a somewhat more realistic use case to see you know, how inclusion goes on some committees and so on. Yeah, I, I support that as well. That, that's probably pretty good. I wouldn't mind um, yeah, getting rid of Piemont as well. We might as well do that to it. Something to consider if we do it with Piermont is that we have to get, we're getting users to run it now, so we have to make sure it's all included in releases and things like that, um, just something for everyone to consider. And, and I hope that uh, we'll be able to use uh, the next few days to kind of run out these issues we are seeing. That would be great. Uh... We should definitely keep an eye on the seat committee aggregation, like Adrian mentioned. And yeah, I mean, generally, I think the progress is going well. So uh, we'll just keep pushing forward. Yeah, I mean, in terms of in terms of the fork for Piemont, I think it needs to be probably at least a couple of weeks out anyway, because we need to get that the config for Piemont updated in each client and a release. So everyone has to get a release out. And then we've got to convince users to upgrade or it'll just go into non-finality and kind of cause chaos just because people didn't upgrade more than because there's a problem with the fork. Um, so we want to give a fair bit of lead time, I'd say. Was there a tentative um, date for forking Piermont already? No, I think we were going to try and decide that on this call. I mean, um, what jumps to mind for me is a month, um, three weeks or, or three or four weeks. Yeah, I think the minimum would be two, three is probably better. Yeah, I think, two weeks, I think two weeks work, two, four weeks work with us since we still have to um, merge all the hardware changes into, into, into our master read range, so. That, that was a vote for four weeks, was it, Prism? I will say... Terrence, you do have a name. 
Yes, no, no worries. Uh, I would say between three to four weeks, yeah. So three is fine too. Okay. I mean, sounds like there's rough consensus for three. Um, you know, obviously, if something comes up, we can reevaluate. But uh, yeah, I mean, the sooner we move to Piermont, the sooner we get to mainnet. So. Yeah, totally. If it's if it's useful, I don't mind. Um, like, if we want to spin up another dev net next week, I'm I don't mind doing that. It's fairly low um, input on my end. Um, Maybe I just won't stay up for it, but we could we could spin one up if, if that's going to be useful to anyone if they're having problems. I'm happy to, to do that. So, Right, and that may be helpful, but uh, yeah, it does seem like the forking part is going well, so then maybe we can just keep the DevNet 2 running for these various uh, you know debugging issues. Yeah, sure. I guess if anyone would like very strongly prefer DevNet 3, then, uh, you know, let's chat. But um, I guess we'll just see how that, if there's demand. Okay, so it sounds like maybe DevNet 3, maybe we don't need it. Uh, I guess we'll look more at DevNet 2 from this morning and have a better idea. And we can uh, discuss that asynchronously. And then it sounds like there's rough consensus around uh, Paramount 4 can say three weeks uh, once we've gotten some more debugging updates in and releases into clients and then that push to users so everyone's aware. And uh, then we can do that. Nice one. I'm going to be proud. <laughs> Great. Okay. Um, let's see. From here, I'll move on to other different types of updates. Was there anything with Altair that anyone wanted to raise before we move on? Okay. In that case, uh, let's move on to research updates or updates with uh, spec generally. Does anyone have anything to add here? Okay, sounds like no, in which case we'll move on to our next topic, the merge updates. Does anyone have anything to present here? Um, okay, I'll not to call you out, but maybe if you have something to, uh, to update there. Yeah, I can give like a short update on that. Um, yeah, first, uh, EAP 3675 has been merged recently. Uh, thanks a lot for EAP editors to give it a green light. Um, uh, it's uh, in a draft status anyway, so it will be definitely updated further and more clarification will be added uh, on demand. Uh, there is already um, a follow-up discussion in the PR thread uh, regarding some points. Uh, so, um, yeah, but uh, anyway, it's already um, should be considered by client developers as the thing uh, that will be implemented and uh, it would be great they starting to take a look uh, in order to facilitate uh, further development of the spec. Um, also on the beacon chain side, uh, the beacon chain uh, spec, uh, the merge spec has been replaced to Altair. Many thanks to Proto who did this job. Um, I, I've also opened a pull request uh, with uh, our base in uh, this, this spec to London actually adds the base fee per gas uh, field to the execution payload and adds a couple of uh, verification rules uh, to the gas limit and to the base fee. Um, so it's open now. Um, 
I guess, yeah, it, it, it's, it's pretty straightforward. I guess it can be merged uh, relatively soon. Uh, also, there is an open PR uh, for the P2P interface uh, for the merge stack as well. Um, so that's that's solved on the merge side from from myself. Cool, thank you. Yeah, it's very exciting to see all the EIPs and the continued progress on uh, the Beacon Chain spec. And, you know, that'll, sounds like that'll be the thing we focus on after out the air. So good that we're getting it already. Okay, uh, we can move to general spec discussion. Anything else anyone wants to bring up? Is there anything uh, anyone would like to discuss? Just regarding the uh, forking out there, um, it might be handy to have, like, maybe f -Stacker could be involved in this or something, but it might be handy to have just a resource um, that's a table of all the clients and which version you need to be on for the Altair fork. Uh, this is for Piermont, that is, and whether or not that version is being released or, or, yet, or not yet. I'm um, kind of like a canonical source of info. Um, I don't know if there's anyone from F Staker on the call or anyone who's interested in doing something like that. Just thinking it might be good to, to start to get the word out ASAP that, you know, you're going to have to upgrade your client because we're going to fork Altair. Uh, and we're going to fork Piermont with Altair, and, and this is where you should look for updates. We are planning a blog post about that for Prism, but I do think it may be beneficial if something comes from its staker or, or, or like EF for a more general blog post. Yeah, the more channels, the better. Cool. Yeah, we'll blog post it as well. We'll make lots of noise about it on our end too. Yeah, definitely a great idea. Uh, something we should definitely do. And yeah, and the more channels, the better. Um, I have a quick question to client of the about this week's subjectivity sync. Uh, what is like the rough target uh, in terms of um, date? Uh, for releasing this uh, feature, is it like uh, uh, Altair or near near some? I think Teku already has weak subjectivity. Um, for us, probably before Altair, I would say maybe in the coming month or so. Not sure about uh, anyone else. Uh, for Prism, you'll be after a tear. Probably, I would say um, a month after a, a tear ish. Yeah. Lockstar already had it implemented since a month ago. We've also had some progress on this and we plan to finish it uh, within the next month. We probably also will have uh, in a month or, or so. Uh, the client is, is generally ready as, as uh, as it already loads the state uh, from from the um, uh, anchor state, but uh, I would like to trust the other teams. What what were the main uh, things that you found in the in this uh, week's subjectivity implementation? As uh, as far as I know, uh, you need uh, you need the back syncing of uh, of the old blocks uh, before the uh, before the state that you load. And is there is there anything else? Uh, that needs to be uh, done uh, during this um, uh, this week subjective to sync. Uh, one of the surprise things is you need to check the signatures when you're doing the back syncing of blocks because they're not included in the hash. Um, but otherwise, I think it was fairly straightforward. I mean, you know, as much as anything ever is. Uh, but nothing nothing surprising. It's just being able to start from the state and go forward from there. And do do you do like a uh, the syncing in in reverse? Basically, do 
do do you use some mechanism which actually verifies that you end up in a in a state that you just loaded? Yeah, so we we work backwards. We work backwards in batches. So we request, I don't know what the actual number is, but say a hundred blocks at a time, um, mm -hmm. kind of from the state we started with, a hundred blocks back forward, and we check that, that matches, and we get we kind of keep walking backwards. Uh, it's it's a little optimistic in that we get a few batches from different peers at the same time, and then check they all line up and that kind of stuff. But ultimately, it, it lets you not download too many blocks from the wrong branch before you discover that it doesn't actually line up with the state you've got. Mm, and the, at the end, do you check that you are at the genesis that you expect uh, to be? No, we treat the state we started as, as definitive because you can put anything you like in the blocks, ultimately. Um, the, only, the only reference point you've actually got is the hash in the state started with um, okay right you you have to check signatures but if you are, as long as you own one validator basically you can get something that lines up back with to the genesis block because you just sign a block that that has the parent hash of genesis and it'll it'll look completely valid all the hashes line up okay but theoretically i believe that the uh, uh it would be possible to uh, to make a, a different chain, uh, which uh, um, l let's assume you you got a wrong uh, snapshot from from an attacker, and you uh, you probably would be able to end up with a different genesis, not the uh, the, the the main one or the community one. Uh, I believe this is theoretically possible, right? It is possible that the attacker would be mm -hmm. sloppy and make it obvious that they've led you astray, but more likely they would just line it up to the genesis. So the check doesn't give you any extra security. Ah, okay. 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 Okay, Clara. Interesting. I think the, the solution would be maybe to, to have some uh, uh, checkpoints uh, uh, inside the, uh, I mean, between the, uh, the genesis and the uh, and the uh, snapshots and uh, yeah as long as you as, as these checkpoints are burned into the client and and uh, we'll be assume that the clients are uh, are not adversaries and uh, then probably that would work uh, don't think so kind of the same thing um so if if the checkpoint you have is within the weak subjectivity period then yes you could verify fully from there so you mm -hmm. ultimately want the state from there so you can actually verify the block transitions board. But the the checkpoint state you're starting from is the checkpoint. Like it's it is the, the one known state that you're being told this is on the chain. You can't easily trust stuff before that, um, because it it you, you might have had validators that have exited and withdrawn all their funds and then sign a completely valid looking chain. So there's there's a number of heuristics you can do to start detecting that and, and so on, but ultimately, your, your key thing is that you want to start from a state that's known to be valid within the weak subjectivity period, and you can do that either with a state or with a, a root hash, and where you get those from is kind of the big question in, in all of this, um, uh, but but it is that it's the checkpoint you're starting from that's that's what's giving you security. And checking back from there is kind of mm. less useful because all your transitions are from the state you started from anyway. And if if you try to sync uh, from the genesis, uh, I mean the, the other way around, not, not the backwards, but the forward. Uh, I'm just thinking: is is there any benefit uh, in terms of uh, of security here? Um, well, so so then you can be led astray by validators that have exited because you because of the weak subjectivity. I mean, so mm -hmm. not enough validators have exited yet, but theoretically it, it could have happened by now, I think. And certainly at some point in the future, it will become a, a possible attack um, that, that you can have a chain made up of signatures where you have nothing that's slashable, um, which makes two completely valid chains. One of them is the canonical chain because we it happened at, in real time and one of them came along afterwards. 
um, unless someone tells you which is the canonical chain or you start applying heuristics like I can find more nodes on this chain oh, yeah. than that chain. Yeah, I think it's, uh, I, I understood this. Uh, I, I remember this discussion sometime before. Uh, yeah, we had this. Uh, okay. Okay, so, so basically you just uh, sync backwards and, and that's uh, all uh, in terms of uh, checking the uh, and signature for sure. Yeah, and the rest of the things is just details. So making sure that your client is able to handle REST API requests from before you have any state. Um, so there's a whole bunch of REST APIs that you can't answer because you don't have a state. For Teku, that was natural because we have a, a mode that will prune anything, any finalized states anyway to save disk space. Um, is, is, there, is there any calls that, that would affect the... The gossip sub score? No. So okay. the, the the operation, like in terms of tracking the head of the chain and performing validated duties and participating in in network, you don't need any states prior to the latest finalized. Um, you mm -hmm. do need to backfill those blocks at the moment. Um, hopefully, once all clients support checkpoint sync, then we can not necessarily download all the blocks, but there's then questions around who is storing them? Are they going to be lost forever kind of thing? And so there's some other problems to solve there. Okay, so, so to summarize, there is no much uh, magic uh, there, just basically loaded uh, the state and, and seeing the blocks uh, backwards and that's all uh, pretty much. Yep, correct. Okay, thanks. Um, is, is there a, anywhere a detailed description of the algorithm of this sync? Like starting from uh, getting the checkpoints, uh, going through the state onloading, and so forth. I don't know if it's down. Hmm. Was that okay. all? I don't know. Oh, Adrian, okay. yeah. well, I was going to say, yeah, nothing, nothing written down, but... Uh, yeah, basically you just start from the state and then uh, work your way backwards. But it is very important, I would say, to backfill. And it, you know, it's, I think, even kind of on us to like say that we have the norm that you should backfill. Because then like Adrian was kind of hinting at, you might have this huge problem where suddenly no one has the blocks and I don't think we want to get to that state. I mean, in terms of how it all works, the whole spec is is designed to be able to take a state and a block and you can always apply it. So it's kind of nice that there's no real reason to start from Genesis uh, in terms of what you have in your client. You just don't need it. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Please do backfill blocks. Don't make it optional. Don't even provide a flag to not do it. Just, just do it. It'll be good for the network at the moment. Yeah, that's our approach as well. But I mean, long term, it would be nice if people could run like validators without or generally for nodes without having all the history always present. Yeah, absolutely. There's a there's a chicken and egg problem that's been going on for a while here in that we didn't support checkpoint sync in a lot of clients because there's nowhere to get checkpoints states from. Um, and it was a real pain to start with now that infure is providing it it's kind of centralized which isn't isn't ideal we'd like more than just them but at least it's a starting point uh, so as more clients start supporting it it becomes more viable for everyone to do it hopefully more places to get it from hopefully then we start to address this problem of where we store old blocks but so that not every client has to have it um i kind of just keep working this problem until we are we are able to just store the very latest stuff in in each running node and have reliable ways of getting older stuff. Uh, one second, one do, why do you need to uh, verify the blocks, uh, block signatures when you are backfilling? The block hash that's included in, so the parent root 
of each block is actually the hash tree root of the beacon block, not the signed beacon block. So the signature isn't included in it. So most likely you're going to get the right signature and it's not going to be an issue. But it's possible that I can give you the right block with the wrong signature via RBC. I guess if you valid, well, as long as you validate it there, that's fine. But you've got to validate it somewhere along the line there um, to make sure that the signature is actually the one that matches that block. Otherwise, you will store the wrong wrong signature and then potentially serve those wrong blocks or those wrong signatures to other other nodes when they request them from you. Yeah, I see. So, so basically, the block signs the signature. <laughs> Yasik had a proposal to add an extra field to the beacon state to include the the block signature sign as well in there. So you could just go backwards with that vote referring signatures, but it didn't make it into Altair, but maybe we'll include it one day. I think it's probably still open on the FSpecs repo if anyone's interested. As a PR. And you would also need to uh, recreate some states to verify those signatures, right? Uh, no, you, you can do it without creating the states. In fact, there's no way to create all the states when you start from before the checkpoint you start with. So you can't run the process backwards, basically. Um, but it's, it's just verified with the validator's public key, which you can get from the current state because we never lose them. Oh, I get it. So you can't verify that the proposer was due to propose that block, but the proposer index is in the hash. So if you're following the hashes back, then you've already verified that, that is right. Yeah, I get it. Thank you for, thanks a lot for our clarification. Regarding the history, I'm just wondering, will, will there be a, a big demand for a history of uh, beacon chain after the merge, before the merge point. Uh, maybe somebody was discussing about that because it, it looks like uh, after the merge, the, there won't be, uh, I don't know, maybe stakers will like to see their past performance, but otherwise as, uh, as this uh, history of beacon chain until the merge point uh, doesn't have an execution layer uh, uh, history of, of data, uh, don't you think that maybe after the merge, uh, clients uh, will not sync uh, uh, the state before the merge, and maybe this will be a common behavior? Was there such uh, discussion? I don't know if I've heard something like that. I would kind of suggest to uh, keep the full state and you know our history. I should say, and as much you know as much as possible. I think we should have the norm that we have the full history. Um, some of these things we've been discussing around like, you know, these longer term projects around serving historical state are super important. I'd say they're like parallel streams of work. Um, but yeah, until then, uh, you can know to store everything they can. And yeah, maybe down the line, there's different sync modes or printing modes that, uh, you know, drop state before the merge, but, uh, we're not there yet. <laughs> I think in general, if no, Go on, Michael. if no client includes an option to prune old blocks, then most people will just use what's available. If clients start including options to prune old blocks, then um, I think you will see a lot of people using that option. Yeah, absolutely. That's And that's what we've seen on the ETH one side, get downloads, yeah. stores all blocks by default, so most people have them available. Yeah, I think the, 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 this uh, discussion came to me because I was thinking uh, uh, that for users, it may be a bit uh, hard to, uh, you know, to, to use the, let's say, API of, uh, of past blocks, uh, for instance, where you, uh, you may have, uh, you may have uh, past block of uh, proof of uh, work chain, uh, which is uh, after a while there will be a uh, block that has uh, same block numbers uh, on both uh, 
chain, uh, basically, uh, on both chains. So there will be a block number. Uh, there is a block number of um, number 1000. Uh, uh, and it exists uh, both on, on proof of work chain and uh, on Bitcoin chain. And from user perspective, well, there will be uh, some maybe some confusion or, or you know which which block is uh, number 1000 we could so after the merge from a... go ahead Micah. i was gonna say we, we could just say like just from a con social consensus standpoint that all beacon blocks are plus 100 million or something just to make sure we don't have collisions on the numbers for UX pur purposes. It is an interesting question because mainnet is 5 million blocks or so ahead of where the beacon chain will be. So when the merge happens, the head block number will drop backwards by a million or you know, by a few million. Yeah, so inside of consensus blocks, we still have uh, execution blocks counting up from 5, 10 million or whatever they're at forever. And so they'll always be conflicting. Yeah, so I think, I think it is something that we just need to be clear in the REST APIs of how you're referring to things. Uh, or in the JSON RPC, rather. Um, I don't know how much work has been done on this to date. It hadn't occurred to me until now, so I might just be a bit slow. Yeah, and I was just going to add, it's almost a bit of an API issue. Um, but yeah, I mean, the more I think about it, the more I do see the conflict. So. One thing we could say is like, hey, this is a slot number on the beacon chain, and then we can keep the block numbers as they are on the execution chain. Um, but yeah, that, that is a good point. Yeah, you know, we're also going to have shard blocks as well. I guess people just have to get used to being specific about what type of block they're talking about. And rollout blocks. <laughs> <laughs> It'll just we'll just keep adding more blocks. Of all block numbers have a prefix basically, which indicates where they're from. We just keep a list somewhere of you know prefix. Uh, one billion is execution client and pre or prefix zero is execution client. Prefix one is consensus client. Prefix two is shard n, and then these prefixes just you know are a billion plus whatever the actual block number is. So that way when you're seeing a block number, it's always a big number, but it always starts with kind of a hint as to what kind of block number it is. I think the prefixes or, or some magic with numbers may affect the current execution layer. Uh, I believe uh, there are some contracts that are using block numbers. And, or maybe yeah. indirectly uh, are using that. But the, the only one way that just came to my head, and uh, I don't, this is not nice, but uh, maybe it will contribute to, to, the, uh, to the discussion. Maybe we could, we could uh, during the match, we just uh, roll uh, the beacon chain uh, block number, slot number. Uh, to to the future, which is uh, aligned to the last uh, uh, proof of work block, and uh, uh, I believe uh, that maybe in future we actually we, we will just forget the uh, the beacon chain uh, for the uh, match uh, because I, I personally don't see much value for uh, for users of this uh, history. Uh, then we would have a liner. Uh, block numbers uh, basically so so just to repeat uh, uh, during the merge we just roll uh, roll a slot number uh, to the future uh, which is uh, like a next uh, number after the proof of work uh, the last proof of work uh, block so this makes uh, a liner uh, 
very nice uh, uh, numbering. So j just an idea. Maybe it's not uh, uh, the best, uh, but uh, yeah, let's let's discuss uh, uh, maybe after uh, this call. All right, skip yeah. slots as it mentioned in my folder. Skip slots will get this thing to diverge anyway. Like there will be slots uh, with no blocks in it, and uh, block uh, execution block numbers will uh, be behind this uh, behind the slot number eventually. Note that slot numbers are much more like timestamps than uh, block heights. Yeah, unless we change the logic in uh, in the clients. Uh, yeah. Uh, but but uh, I think, uh, yeah, of course, this this would add extra complexity. Uh, but uh, otherwise, I think it would be uh, possible, uh, of course, with, with complexity consequences, uh, to uh, to just uh, handle uh, this uh, role uh, in the code. In Which problem theory. are we trying to solve? The height is already embedded in the beacon block. And if there's an index in the client to map slots to block heights, everything just works fine. Uh, so I don't think there's a, a code problem. I think this is just from a user standpoint. Um, users are going to end up incredibly confused when you have you know, block number five slash seven. Like, what, what is that? So like for, for users, it would be nice if there's an easy way when they're communicating with each other and when websites present data to them, there's an easy way to identify, oh, this is a consensus block or, oh, this is an execution block. Right, so like adding a prefix to the hash might be helpful, kind of like Michael was suggesting. Yeah, I mean, post-merge, you're either, you're either talking slots, which contain, you know, so that's, that's how we number the consensus blocks, um, or you're talking height of execution blocks. Um, uh, I mean, the, the place that this hits, it, it probably hurts, you know, block explorers and things like that a bit, but the biggest issue is going to be around the, the JSON RPC client, which is, is where execution clients, uh, so yeah, where the execution clients are really exposing this stuff and they have the backwards compatibility concerns from a, a beacon node perspective, we're always going to talk in slots. We'll probably have some APIs that let you query by um, execution height, but it potentially maps to multiple beacon blocks. Um, but all, all the all the challenges in, in backwards compatibility and making this understandable to users is really going to be the execution clients. So I wonder if, if this is something to bring up tomorrow on core devs more than here because uh, they've got the context and the actual ability to do something about it. Uh, just so we were prepared for that call, is, is it terribly unreasonable or reasonable to at some point before the merge or on the merge to just move the block number forward by a very, very large number? Is so that going to be really hard, or is that easy? Personally, I would say that would be right, when I said block number, yeah. I mean consensus uh, slot number. Yeah, so the slot number. So the, the advantage right now is that you can take a time and calculate the slot, and it just works. You, you, know, you need to know the genesis time, um, but it's a simple division. Uh, if you change it, mm -hmm. you've got a simple division prior to this number, and then a bunch of slots that don't exist at all, which is weird, and then uh, a simple division okay. from a different genesis route. So it kind of, uh, at some point, we maybe wind up doing that if we ever change the, the slot time. Uh, but if we can put it off as long as possible, it'd be really nice. Okay. Yeah, I would also say that skipping forward the slots is, is, is going to be really complicated. The, spec, the F2 spec relies a lot on the idea of the current epoch and the previous epoch, epoch being 32 slots. Um, and to have gaps in that is going to be super edge casey. I can just imagine heaps of clients all over the place finding bugs in that. You know, every time you subtract one from the slot, um, now you need to go and make sure you need to either slot, subtract one or five million or something. So I, I'd say that's a bit, bit, bit complicated in my opinion. 
it gets worse. Okay. The whole Fedidator registry has references to slots notable per Fedidator for their lifecycle data. And so if a Fedidator tries to exit, they suddenly get into some very weird state. So I'm hearing very hard. I think that's right. Mm, no, 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 the idea, maybe we can have a two numbers, actually. The one is uh, like a classical uh, execution layer 8 or something. And another one is a consensus uh, uh, slot. Uh, this maybe would not, basically this would not uh, break anything uh, on, on each end as it doesn't inter interfere with each other. What do you think? So you're saying just when you expose the slot number to the rest of the world, you just like, you know, add 5 million to it, but for internal communication, you're using the real slot number? Mm, no, I, I would say maybe we keep as a, as a public number, we keep the uh, execution layer number, uh, which, which is the current proof of work uh, 8. Uh, but internally, uh, we have these uh, slot numbers, uh, which we uh, just I mean, we may show it uh, somewhere in, in explorers or or something uh, like that. But the actual block numbers uh, would be uh, just as as it is now in the proof of work. So so there will not be any gaps, any uh, I mean for for the uh, for the. Uh, execution layer uh, numbers, uh, there will not be any gaps, uh, it will just proceed. Uh, but uh, uh, at some point uh, during the merge, uh, there will be a two numbers, uh, uh, one number will be execution layer, uh, uh, execution layer, layer number, and then another one will be, so, so there will be peers every time. Uh, and uh, another number is a slot uh, number of uh, consensus uh, layer. So the, the, the execution client uh, execution payload uh, will still have the, the incrementing block number. Um, yeah. The execution environment will still execute. So that, that separation still exists. You've still got slot and execution block number that just flows through. It's just about avoiding confusion of which one you're specifying, um, which I think really just comes down to which API you're talking to. If you're talking to the execution client, then you're talking in execution block numbers. If you're talking to the beacon node, you're talking in slots. Um, yeah, but in the, as the, uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, as the APIs evolve, we we may get into points where that becomes more confusing. But then we can kind of design the APIs to take either or and and specify which type it is and that kind of thing. Yeah, for users, I I believe that they probably should see one number as a main number, uh, and it would be great as uh, that, that uh, it uh, it is uh, just a continuation of. Uh, execution layer uh, numbers well I, I think this is an interesting uh, topic overall yeah <laughs> I, I don't think we'll get to one number because slot and height are, are always going to be two different numbers they just don't increment at the same speed um, today yeah. in the in the consensus chain we don't really track height at all we just use slot but it becomes more important the execution thing Um, I, I suspect we might have covered this as much as we possibly can, given where the beacon note side of this. Um, if there's, like as I said, there's, if there's going to be confusion and problems, it's going to come up with the JSON RPC APIs. Um, so I wonder if we if we need to spend more time on this here, or if we just shelve it and see what what the execution guys want. Yeah, we can move on. I mean, it, it kind of sounds like uh, just having a pair of these numbers and just being clear about sort of the types of what you're referring to is uh, the simplest path forward. And we can leave it open for, uh, you know, experimentation with other options.
So on that note, uh, does anyone else have anything else? Um, yeah, I wanted to mention, um, I have been talking about uh, Crowder and Adashpur a few times before, and I wanted to uh, share it with you today. Um, mostly, we um, show information about the geographical distribution of the nodes and uh, also the uh, different client uh, distribution, uh, which is not um, uh, what we might expect. Uh, I mean, it could be better. Uh, in terms of software distribution. Um, and, uh, we have a couple of other things that you can see in the dashboard. Um, and so also want to mention that um, the press release for the standardization of the metrics uh, has been merged. Uh, thanks, uh, Pari, for that. And so I would like to ask uh, the different clients, implementers, to please um, uh, do the few changes that are necessary. Uh, so that uh, we have um, metrics, uh, in standard metrics uh, across our clients uh, in a few couple of weeks, if possible. And yeah, I think that would be all. Thank you. Great, thank you. Yeah, it's very exciting to see this dashboard. Thanks. Anything else from anyone? Otherwise, we can go ahead and uh, call it early today. Um, there's one thing I realized that when I look at the mainnet validator count is that it's slowly creeping up to be to be the same as the Praetor number. So um, we don't have to make a decision, um, but I do think that we should increase the val validator count on the Praetor side whether that's post a tear or before a tear. But uh, we, we don't have to make a decision today, but I just want to uh, notify people that. I agree with that sentiment. Yeah, thanks for bringing it up, Terrence. It's uh, definitely important to keep an eye on. Just that we probably don't want to fork Pyramont and Prater at the same time, but uh, we can probably get to Prater, you know, after Pyramont. Okay. Any final things? Otherwise, we will wrap it up. Okay, sounds like no. So thanks for joining everyone. Uh, again, very, very excited to see all the progress in Altair and uh, we will keep pushing on that. And uh, yeah, I think that'll be it. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thanks.